Great pleasure to introduce Helen Bevan, who's the Chief Transformation Officer in NHS Horizons, who's going to talk to us with a, a session entitled Being Architects of Change, Structures and Powers. Now, I did have a biog for Helen, but my um, my team uh, did dig out some background. So I hope, Helen, that this is, this is OK. And my notes tell me that um, at the age of seven, uh, your ambition was to be a sewing teacher and you made a pair of purple hot pants from a pre-cut kit. Now, I'm really jealous about that because when I was young, I always wanted a pair of purple hot pants and my mother refused to buy them. So, so hopefully, though, uh, that, is, uh, that is true. Um, and also, uh, I, my notes tell me that if you were a character in the BBC comedy, you've said, uh, W1A, you said you would be the director of Better, which is a fantastic uh, job title and a job I'm sure lots of us would be, would be aspiring to. But obviously, in the real world, uh, you are the Chief Transformation Officer of NHS England's Horizons team and your job uh, involves large-scale change um, and I liked your philosophy um, so rocking the boat without falling out and you've so so, so far succeeded and that was something I think from a, a, an interview you did in the BMJ in 2018 so um, I'm hoping you're on the call I can't see you there at the moment um, but um, Helen are you there? Yes, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm here, Julie. And can, you hear, can you hear me loud and clear? Indeed we can. And is it true about the purple hot pants? Um, yeah, it is true about the purple hot pants. Um, my dad was a, was a sail maker, you know, he made sails for ships. So, um, so he taught me to sew with a sewing machine um, um, when I was five. And um, shall I tell you another um, blast from my past, which isn't well known? Yes, um, um, which is, um, uh, I was... Dean Royal's first ever boss. Wow! Gosh. Yes, yes. Um, when we were when we were both in our twenties at um, at Sheffield City Council. So, um, yeah, a lot of water under the bridge for both of us since then. So that's incredible because we always think that Wales is a very small place. But as as I've been involved with the HBM over the years, I've learned that actually England is also quite a small place in our community. So. Um, yes, yes. So, um, so yeah, really happy to, um, um, Julie, to, to be with you and the uh, HPMA um, this morning. And um, if we could, uh, if we can show my slides, um, that will be uh, that will be great. And um, uh, we'll uh, we'll get going. Wonderful. I'm going to let Rachel do that for us, and I'll hand over yeah. to you. Thank you, Helen. See yeah. You in a bit. Thanks. Thanks, Julie. See you. See you shortly. So, so what a great um, topic for um, for a conference, you know, about being architects of um, of change. And what I wanted to do between um, between now and eleven o'clock um, is to talk um, a little bit about that theme in the context of people and also in the um, the COVID situation that we find ourselves in now. So, if I could have the next slide, sure. So let's talk about those three words that are the themes um, um, for the conference, being architects of change. OK, so so let's start off with the first word being. OK, so, you know, to be something is different to do to doing something. So, you know, like being change means doing it with every bit of myself, with my heart, with my head, with my hands, you know, um, uh, the uh, the actions that I take um, every day, I am I'm being the change that I want to see. Okay, so 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 being is the first word. Okay, the second term here, you know, being an architect. Okay, what does it mean to be an architect, particularly in a um, in a change context? I think it means you know we want to make very big change happen. Okay, for our um, for our people in the health and care system. So. You know, um, as an architect, I would start with aspiration and vision and stand back and think, you know, what is the very best world that that we can create for our people? Secondly, as an architect, it's about understanding how the world works and going with it and and building on, you know, the very strong foundations um, that we have um, at the moment. And it's also around actually understanding the reality um, of the world and working with that, not something conceptual or based on assumptions. 
It's about finding the very best models. You know, what are the, you can think about architectural models, structural models, um, we can think about change models. But, you know, what models often do is give us um, different ways to see the world and enable us to build different things. And being an architect of change is also about exploring different ideas and possibilities. It's about visualizing, you know, seeing things in different ways through different eyes. And it's also about adding meaning because, you know, when it comes to, to change, I think particularly in the world that we're in now, um, you know, how do we reduce ambiguity? How do we create certainty for people? And so much of that is about is about meaning making. So how can we as a community of people, people, you know, how can we be architects? to enable um, change to happen and the kind of change that we want to um, we want to see in, in the world. So what I would like to talk to you about this morning is um, is some some ways of fixing some aspirations um, some 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 models, some exploration of ideas that I hope will help in terms of being architects of change. So if we look at the next slide, you know, of all the models um, that I could think about that are relevant right now, this is the one that I choose. And this is a model that talks about power in our world. Power is really important. You know, if I think about a definition of power, um, and I would I would define it as um, is the uh, ability to make happen um, and uh, achieve the results we want to, to achieve. So let's contrast an old power and a new power way of seeing things. Old power is like a currency, it's like money. Very few people have got a lot of it and most of us haven't. So it's like formal authorities and organizations and systems. It's held by a few people and it's pushed down in our organizations and, um, and systems. And we command people to do things, you know? You have to do that because it's the quality standard. You have to do that because it's the HR policy, okay? And the thing about old power, it's closed. So for instance, if I'm the chief exec of a, of a hospital system, say, and I'm working to make change happen with people in the local community, okay, I can't command them to do anything. In a sense, my, my power ends at the door of my organization. And old power is largely transactional. It's about structures and systems and processes. It's about governance mechanisms. It's about holding people to account. Let's contrast that with new power. New power is like an energy, a current that's made by many people coming together with the same aspirations and the you know, the same values, wanting similar things. And the more people that engage in my new power um, uh, change initiative or movement or campaign, then the more power we have. And we can pull it into our organizations and systems. It's shared, it's open. Anybody that wants the same things, it's, uh, aspires to the same things that, that the other people um, who are part of that new power movement want, um, then, um, uh, you know, can be in it. And new power is largely about relationships. You see, one of the big differences between, between new power and old power is that people will join in in a new power way because they want to, okay? Not because they have to in an old power world where you have to do it because it's the policy or it's the structure um, or it's the standard. And the thing is with new power, if people are engaging in it because they want to, they'll have expectations that things will happen as a result. So if I engage, you know, in a in some change uh, because it's, you know, I'm because it it, um, it fits with who I am in the world and the things that I want to see happening, and my expectations are raised and nothing happens, then I won't join in that new power effort again. Now. When we think about our world, you know, our world of human resources and workforce and people, what I'd say is that, um, you know, particularly in the health and care system, um, I think we've been very focused in old power ways, you know, and, and, and that's important, you know, um, we need the structures and systems and, and processes and, and accountabilities. But I'd say the real opportunities 
that we have at the moment, you know, as architects of change, um, the real opportunities that we we have in terms of our um, our health and care people are around thinking and operating in new power ways and seeing people, workforce, human resources, OD as an, an incredible um, power for change. And I'd say, you know, where we need to be as people, people is operating in that very difficult and um, zigzaggy place in the middle. OK, we need to be able to um, to work with both. So, you know, I know lots of old power leaders um, where I live in the NHS um, in England who um, are trying to make big change happen across systems and are very, very focused on um, you know, the structural and incentive mechanisms um, um, to do that. And those things are important, but again, on their own, they won't create sustainable large scale change. I also know um, lots of people who are, for instance, clinical entrepreneurs or community leaders doing amazing things, but in new power ways, but because they don't understand um, how to navigate the old power system, you know, their ideas will never um, uh, be achieved to scale. So we have to work um, with them. Um, we have to be able to work with both systems. And if I could have the next slide. And, you know, just think about this, um, this old power, new power way of seeing the world. And, you know, when you start to, to have that model in your head, you know, start to realise how, um, how influential it is in terms of COVID, for instance. And when we think about metaphors where we compare two things, saying one thing is the other. So many of the metaphors around our world um, uh, during the pandemic are, um, are old power metaphors. You know, we talk about the war, the fight, the battle against COVID-19. OK, lots of old power kind of criminal metaphors. We talk about lockdown and curfew. Um, on Twitter, we talk about COVID idiots. We talk about transgressors. You know, our clinical colleagues, um, we, we hold them up on a, um, you know, on a, on a podium as, um, as superheroes, um, even though lots of them hate that because, you know, you know, and, and just so many people say to me, I'm not a superhero. You know, a superhero is somebody coming into a system that's in chaos and saving the world. Actually, we're just doing collectively what we do every day. You know, but again, troops in battle, the front line, we talk about battening down and those metaphors are around command and control. They're around top down um, leadership, you know, getting a grip. Okay. And then there's also lots of new power metaphors. OK, you know, um, uh, seeing our response to the pandemic as a journey with challenges and a hopeful destination. It's about positive human actions based on shared purposes. You know, we talk about building or forging and um, reconstructing many different people working together, each playing their part. I like this word interdependence. I think it's, it's such a great word because when you're interdependent, it means you've got your own role to do and your own objectives to achieve. But you'll only achieve those in partnership with other people. You're interdependent on each other. And it's about creating resilient, connected communities. OK, so many people think that, you know, um, leading in a, in a um, uh, you know, in a pandemic world is um, is is old power. But you know what I'd say, if we actually look at where we are at the moment, and again, if I could have the next slide, what we can see is that at every level of the system, this is so relational. So first of all, you know, crisis leadership, actually crisis leadership is highly um, relational. If you look at this quote that I've got here in the top right hand corner from McNulty and Marcus, you know, Actually, crisis leadership is an inclusive leadership approach, it means that each person, you know, whatever their job, whatever their role, understands how they can contribute and that their contribution is recognised. OK, uh, you know, this gives deeper meaning to even the most menial tasks. And, you know, go back to that definition of architecture um, and architects of change. You know, um, our job um, as architects of change is about, you know, giving meaning to everyone. You know, so many of us who um, who used to work in um, in offices and um, and work settings, okay, um, are now at home working from home, and 
you know, the, the relational side of virtual working is absolutely critical. And I just had some interesting um, stats here from Gremmy and Maxfield. And they say, you know, virtual teammates are two and a half times more likely to perceive mistrust, broken commitments and bad decision making um, with distant colleagues than those who are co-located. And people that work virtually report it takes five to ten times longer um, to address their concerns. I'm involved in a project at the moment in the, a, a new project that's just starting um, called Hashtag Project M and it's a um, it's going to be a peer community and resources for people who are team leaders and managers um, ac across the across the NHS and uh, you know, we've we just started some work, um, you know, talking to lots of frontline managers and so many of those managers whose teams are becoming, uh, uh, you know, became suddenly virtual um, at, the, at the start of the um, at lockdown, you know, are saying how critical um, these issues are and um, and how, in a sense, um, you know, they need more support to actually manage the relational side of virtual working. And then my final quote here is about the phenomenal community uh, response during um, COVID. And, you know, it's pretty amazing. And I, uh, again, this, this quote from Arabi here, you know, and many pathways towards a better world are being laid bare by the altruistic mutual aid efforts arising in cities, not just cities, in, in loca locations, communities around the globe. These locally designed and collaboratively built acts of solidarity which view vulnerable people as participants in their survival rather than passive consumers of assistance. They inform a model of community resilience and collective empowerment with implications far beyond their um, immediate um, impact, you know. So in terms of who we are, you know, um, people, people, okay, you know, we are the people that are taking these relational approaches forward. And if we could have the next slide. So, you know, um, the, the title of this talk was about, about structure and power. And I'd say at the heart, you know, of our mission as architects of change is, is a design dilemma. And I'd call it structure versus agency. Um, I know that lots of you, like me, are, are social scientists. And, um, and, you know, when you do a social science undergrad, one of the first models that you learn or the first dilemmas um, that you, you, get, you get taught about is about structure versus agency. Okay. And let's just compare the two. Okay. Um, structure. If we're trying to, if we're architects of change, we're seeking to make change happen through, um, through, through structure. It isn't just about organizational structure. It's, it's structure in its widest sense. Okay. But it's about um, structures and systems, performance goals, compliance systems, regulation, policies, program management, um, incentive systems. Okay, all those aspects are, are if you like, um, of ways of um, of nudging and pushing people towards um, towards certain behaviours. And if we want to make change happen, we change those things. Okay, let's talk about um, agency. Okay. Um, I'm going to come on the next slide. I'm going to give a definition of agency. But um, but agency is about um, our ability, both individually and collectively, um, uh, to make a to make a difference. Okay, it's about activation. It's about our ability to make choices. It's about collective action. So, you know, when we talk about new power, okay, new power is about collective agency. It's about creating leaders everywhere. Social action, solidarity, social movements. Okay. If you look at the last three decades, okay, of um, of um, of public service and policy reform, okay, the predominant approach has been around structure. So when we're trying to reform things, when we're trying to change things, we change the structure. What we're seeing increasingly, okay, particularly in the COVID um, uh, pandemic response, is a shift. Um, uh, towards agency. I also think the same thing is happening um, with regard to, um, uh, you know, the, the people function, uh, workforce, human resources. Okay, there's been a very big focus on the the structural aspects. Okay, in its structure, in its widest sense. And what we're seeing now is a massive shift towards agency. So let's look at that definition of agency. If I could have the next slide. 
agency is about the power individually and collectively um, to make a positive difference. So when I feel agency, I feel able to make uh, to make change happen and I can grow my own agency in terms of you know how I am um, how I operate in the world and I can grow my agency collectively with other people again if I could have the next slide how do we build agency and um, here's a lovely example and um, I do a lot of work with uh, in, in Sweden okay and um, uh, in young shipping in Sweden, it's a small community in the south of Sweden, but it gets the best health outcomes of anywhere in Sweden and, and actually of anywhere in the world. And one of the things that um, uh, leaders in, in young shipping in Sweden have done is they've created a living library. So when you think about a library, you know, you think about a library as a place where you borrow books. OK, and and you borrow books to learn from. Well, the living library is a group of people with lived experience, you know, patient leaders. And so um, the living library, they lend themselves out so that other people who are service users and families can uh, can learn from them. And Sweden, like every other um, uh, country in the world, it, um, uh, you know, with a formal health and care system, is, um, is shifting um, to virtual consultations. As a um, as a result of the um, pandemic, but what happens in most places is that the people that are driving the change are the people in the formal system and the clinicians. What they've done in young shipping is the living library of um, patient leaders has supported thousands of service users to be confident in making this switch to virtual consultation. Again, so they're building individual agency so that individual service users um, feel more confident uh, individually about, you know, um, about virtual consultation. And they're also building collective agency because it's about a whole population, you know, massive group of people that have, that have got the confidence together. If I could have the next slide. So, you know, you might say to me, well, it's all great, you know, you're talking agency and changing the world, but look at me, you know, I'm only an HR manager, you know, I'm only an OD um, uh, facilitator. What difference can I make in the world? Well, um, this data comes from uh, two Canadian researchers, Batalan and Koschiaro, and, um, and they did a project in the English NHS. And what they did, they went around 67 different NHS organisations to see what happened, you know, as a um, uh, in terms of um, who had the agency to make change happen. So who were the great the great um, change agents? Were they the people that worked in old power ways through top down cascade, or um, are the greatest change agents, you know, the people with the most influence to make change happen, the people with the greatest agency for change? Okay. Are they the people who um, work in new power ways at the centre of informal connection? And you know what they found time and time again, okay, was, you know, um, as change agents, actually, the extent to which I am central in the informal network is more important than my position in the formal hierarchy. Big implications for us, you know, who work in, um, who work in the people function, HR workforce, because, you know, um, we're in a system where we want to make change happen and, and very often we, we um, you know, we mostly focus on cascading it down through the formal system. But actually, if we want to make change happen and we want to make it happen quickly, we need to be at the centre of the informal um, system uh, as well. OK, so maybe that's a very different way of working as an architect of change. OK, there's loads of data to back this up. I'll just show you another one if I could have the next slide. And um, this next one comes from Leandro, uh, Leandro Herrero, um, and he is uh, he writes about viral change. And he says people who are highly connected have twice as much power to influence change as people um, with hierarchical power. OK, uh, really important point. If I could have the next slide. So let's carry on with this. You know, um, we as um, I, I think as a, you know, a workforce profession have got to get into understanding social influence and to be social influencers and to work in new power ways if we truly want to be effective uh, leaders of change. OK, so um, so I know lots of us um, 
um, you know, that are listening now, um, we're very familiar with organizational network analysis, ONA, so we can really understand what's happening um, with the people in our organizations. So um, here's some ONA, which comes from Innovisor, which is a Danish organization that my team works with a lot. And, you know, What's interesting, um, Innovisor have worked with over a hundred um, organizations in lots of different sectors. Okay, what they what their organizational network analysis shows time and time again is that in most organizations and systems, there's typically about three percent of people in that organization and system that are influencing 85 percent of the other people. Okay, they're driving conversations um, with 85 percent um, of, um, of other people. OK, so why is this important? Um, if I could have the next slide. Well, because um, if we think, why does change fail in our organisations and systems? It's complex and it fails for lots of reasons. But one of the main reasons is because the people that are leading the change tend to lead it in old power ways. OK, and often don't have um, a dialogue with the informal system. You know, the people that are working in new power ways and, and um, aren't working with these uh, with these super connectors, these informal influencers. Why are these people important? Because they've got the relationships, the networks and they understand the content and the context of the organisation. And they are driving the perceptions of other people. So if there's a new HR policy that's coming, these are the people that, uh, that, that other people in the organization will go to for the advice. And again, you know, we talked in the Architects of Change about being a meaning maker. These are the people that will make sense of things and, and reduce ambiguity um, for other people. And these people typically are trusted by their peers more than formal leaders are trusted. And Mostly the formal leaders do not know who these people are because we're not investing enough in dialogue um, with, with, with the people who are the leaders and the opinion formers in the informal system. And you know what? At a time like in the middle of a pandemic, when there's so much ambiguity, so much uncertainty, it's even more important that we're working with these people. If I could have the next slide. So, you know, um, We've got to get social in our own organisations. You know, we need to understand who the social influencers are and we've got to get social in terms of um, our relationship with them, um, with social media. Do you know, 65 percent of people, according to the local, the latest um, Ofcom, Ofcom study in um, in Britain, OK, 65 percent of people get their news and form their opinions through social media. And if we want to be um, getting the news out there, if we want to be um, helping with opinion forming then we have to be on social media and the same rule applies if you look at the data around health and healthcare globally 85 percent of the content about health and care that gets retweeted comes from just 3.3 percent of people who um, tweet it's almost the same um ratio if i could have the next slide so you know, we shouldn't underestimate the power of social as a source of information to drive change, and we need to be there. So on the left hand side um, of this picture here, you know, we've got a tweet from an oncologist who's basically saying, you know, um, I get during the COVID um, era, I get more of my up to date clinical information from Twitter than from any other source. On the right hand side here is um, is a pro one of the projects I worked on as part of COVID, um, which was an innovation platform for for new ideas about how to overcome some of the um, the blockages around COVID testing at scale. And we ran a project, you know, right across the system with NHS labs, with um, private sector labs about. You know, um, what are your ideas? What, um, you know, um, how are you overcoming some of these blockages around large scale testing? OK, 20 percent of the um, the traffic um, came from social media. OK, it was it was a critical part of driving people um, to that platform and um, and finding solutions that enabled us to scale um, COVID testing. If I could have the next slide. And it's very important for us to find out and um, who the social influencers are. OK, and um, um, here's three examples on the left here. We've got Dave Morgan. He is a paramedic with Northeast Ambulance Service and um, he's massively um, um, socially influential. So um, so if you want to get you know information out, um, 
um, in the ambulance service, okay, um, if you if you actually ask Dave Dave Morgan to tweet it, it will get round to more people much more quickly than uh, than if you do it through the formal system. And we need to do both. And um, in the middle there, we've got Trish Greenhill, and Trish is a um, a GP and a professor of primary care at Oxford University. And I'd say more than anybody else in this country, she has led. Um, the the movement um, towards uh, you know wearing face coverings and masks um, more than any um, individual. She's been so um, influential. And then on the right here, we've got Rachel Clark, Doctor Oxford, and. Um, Rachel is a palliative care doctor who used to be a journalist, knows how to communicate brilliantly and any issue or topic that um, that Rachel promotes. OK, the way that she's able to pull the clinical um, community behind her messages, um, you know, is um, is astonishing. So, you know, we need to be able to uh, um, to work in this way. And anybody who doesn't see the power of social media. Well, um, last Wednesday, um, uh, my team has been supporting um, the People Director of NHS England and NHS Improvement, the Leadership and Lifelong Learning team, um, who are doing a who are setting up a really great new initiative, um, as I mentioned before, called Hashtag Project M, and it's going to be a community, a resource for people who are team leaders and managers um, across the NHS to support um, to support them in their role and health and um, and well being. We held a tweet chat. Uh, with this community uh, last Wednesday night, just for an hour, okay, and 1,217 people joined in that conversation, and they sent 4,066 tweets, and it was all done through informal social influence, and um, and the way that people connected with each other across sectors, you know, the the poignancy and um, the wisdom of those answers was incredible, and it was all done in an hour. This is how we need to be working in the future, one of the ways. If I could have the next slide. So, how do you find your super connectors? Well, you can commission some organisational network analysis, and I know that many of your organisations um, do that already, or you can just ask people. So, you know, um, what we need to do is just go out and just talk to people in our organisation. You know. Who do you go to for information when you've got concerns at work? Whose advice do you trust and uh, respect? And I reckon it takes about 10 people and uh, to find out who your super connectors are. And again, I'm going to make all these slides available um, after this talk. So um, and I've um, I've linked uh, a lot of uh, resources if you want to read about this some more. So coming towards the end of my talk now, if I could have the next slide. You know, what does it mean to me? Well, first thing is that um, we can aspire to be super connectors. And even if we don't quite become one of the three percent, just taking these actions can make a really big difference. OK, you know, put a lot of effort and energy into building our connections and relationships. And, you know, at the beginning, when I talked about being an architect of change, well, being an architect of change means being a model of trust and positive uh, behaviours, because it's all about trust and respect. And that means being somebody that when we say we do something, we'll always, always follow up. OK, we can't necessarily be a super connector. But if I could have the next slide, OK, we can all um, find our super connectors. And again, if we're trying to make change happen, these are the people that can make or break our change. So get their insights, engage them. Um, you know, in the uh, in the change that you're trying to make happen, They've, they have incredible wisdom. And the other thing about you know super connecting, it's highly relational. So you know, don't just uh, work with your super connectors on a particular project and then uh, drop them when the project's over and then ghost them. Okay, because um, because they'll never trust you again. You know, it's relational. We've got to stay connected for the long haul. And if I could have the next slide. So, you know, those of us that are senior leaders, we may be less influential than we think, because if we want to get the same level of influence through top down change, cascading things as that three percent get through um, through social um, connectivity, we need four times more people. And that's why, you know, one of the, the strategies I will always use if I'm going to work in a particular um, area, whether it's in an organizational system or um, it's a it's a it's a wider um, um, community and, and social media is a good way of doing things. OK, first thing I'll always do, go and find our super connectors, our influencers. And if I could have the next slide. 
So, um, you know, this is all about being an architect of change. It's all about um, agency, um, uh, building our own agency, building um, building other people's agency. And actually, um, you know, connecting with super connectors is a, is a really good way in of this. There's lots of other ways that we can build our agency. OK, number one, we can create small changes and um, one step at a time. And very often we underestimate the power of small changes, because when we make a small change that might only involve two or three people, we've made that step from an idea or a concept to something practical that's happening. And we are creating a sense of possibility and hope. Secondly, emphasize progress. You know, um, people can keep going at things for a very long time. And our job is to is to kind of give people a sense that progress is happening. OK, number three, reframe our thinking. So rather than saying, well, that attempt failed, actually, what a fantastic learning opportunity. OK, sometimes, you know, when you're an HR professional, you've got to know everything. You've got to be the kind of oracle of all things people. OK, but and, and you think, well, if I don't know, I'll look weak. Actually, you know, let's flip it. Uncertainty becomes curiosity. Well, I don't know the answer to that, but let's discover it together. What an interesting idea. Number four, find your crew. You know, a, a group of people that are unified in new power ways by provocative ideas. Number five, get social support. You know what we'd say? The number one rule of being a change agent is you can't be a change agent on your own. Okay. Number six, make change routine. That's why I have so much respect for, particularly in the, in the NHS, for organisations okay, that make a big um, commitment and investment in quality improvement, um, um, OD and other change approaches and make it part of the way they do things every day. Okay. Um, you know, number seven, um, learn from the very best. So who are the, you know, the very best people in the world um, that I could learn from? Reach out to them. And the worst thing that can happen is they could say no. And mostly they don't say no. Number eight, think story. You know, in terms of if we want to get people engaged on board in a new power way. Um, you know, what stories can we tell? Because when we tell stories, people connect with our values through emotions. And, you know, that's one of the most powerful ways to bring people on board. OK, number nine, build a spectrum of allies. Very often when we're doing change, we'll, can, we'll stick with people like us. So it becomes like an echo chamber, you know, a small group of um, activists or passionate people that, um, you know, our change never goes beyond that group of people. OK, think about the other people. Think about the people that aren't allies at the moment that we could actually, with a little bit of work, uh, turn into allies. And finally, you know, we have to persist. Uh, um, I did a, um, a study on um, or was part of a study on people that have been brilliant innovators, clinical innovators in the NHS. And the one thing that came through with every single one of these people was just how you have to keep persisting in the long haul. And I think, you know, we can quote Gandhi here. First, they ignore you. Then they laugh at you. Then they fight you. Then you win. You know, we have to stick at it for the long haul. But there's so many ways that we can build change agency individually and collectively. I'm nearly there now. If I could have the next slide. So, you know, when we think about being change architects and we think about, um, the, you know, um, succeeded in that, particularly in the kind of health and care setting that most of us work in. And I'd say we have to be able to operate in old power ways because, you know, we are we are living in a in a world, a health and care world that still largely operates with old power principles. And we need to bring in new power ways, new power approaches to uh, to leadership where we're mobilizing thousands of people, new power ways of building agency, OK, individually and collectively, OK, new power information flows through um, through influencers and super connectors, new power ways of designing change so that we're co-creating with with everybody um, that, you know, that works with us and that uses our services and new power ways of building individual um, uh, capacity. And very finally, I wanted to end with a quote, if I could have the last slide. OK, what next? OK, what next for architects of change? And um, I, um, I chose a quote from one of my favourite plays, which is Pride by Stephen Beresford, which is a play about a group of um, Yorkshire, of, um, um, 
uh, LGTB activists who wanted to play a role um, in the in the miners' strike in um, in Yorkshire. And this character Joe says, you know, whether we march with banners or without, the important thing is that we march together all of us. And that's what this thing has been about from the beginning. And that is absolutely how it is going to end. Together, us united. And, you know, when we think about um, this pandemic, we're not going to sort it in, in, in um, or solve it or um, be able to move to um, a different um, relationship with it in one place or one part of the world or one organisation. You know, uh, we're in this together. And I think that's the underpinning uh, principle of being an architect of change. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. That was phenomenal. Um, how you packed so much into such a short time was absolutely incredible. Um, we haven't got time for questions now, but I just wanted to reflect on just some of the comments on the side. So if you get a chance to have a look at those, you know, there is so much praise for your session this morning. People are saying how fantastic it was, how inspirational it was. We did get some questions around how do you spot the super connectors, but you've kind of dealt with that and given us some, some, you know, some advice and some guidance. So I know personally my head is absolutely buzzing now with, with the idea and sort of um, really looking forward to getting started. Um, I think there were some other comments there as well about, you know, this is, is a hugely complex area, but you've managed to sort of distill it down and actually give us some, some really clear messages in your presentation. And to finish on that quote from Pride, that is an absolutely amazing um, play. And, um, you know, that's, that's just great, isn't it? In a, in a footballing context in Wales, I know for the last European Cup, we had hashtag together stronger. Uh, I won't mention the road because Wales lost against England on the weekend. Um, but, you know, that sense, uh, as I was trying to convey at the start of collaboration, connectedness, actually working together is the only way we can go forward in this. So, so thank you for such an inspirational session. Um, and um, hopefully we'll catch up again soon. Brilliant, thank you. Okay, so colleagues, um, what a fantastic um, couple of speakers that we've had already. Um, and it's only 11 o'clock, but the fact that it is 11 o'clock does mean that I can get my HBMA Wales branch mug out. Hopefully I'll get some brownie points from my colleagues in Wales for that. Um, so it means that we've got a break now for half an hour, but please don't just make a cup of coffee and go do your emails. Please actually top up your caffeine levels and visit our virtual exhibition booths and network with all our partners and participants. As Dean said, some great prizes and prize draws. So please make the most of the next half an hour. And can I ask you to be back online in the main stage for 11.30 uh, for our next exciting speaker, Tom Simons. Brilliant. Thank you so much, everybody. See you in the booths. See you back on the main stage in half an hour. Deal. <laughs>